fishing hooky power. Day in my life. Subscribe. Hit that like button. Peace. Uh, with me today I have some of our staff, um, our outreach specialist uh, Sheila Craig, many of you know Ms. Sheila who worked with uh, USDA for many years, uh, Sherwin Best somewhere, that's she has stepped in the door, uh, Sherwin was, is a uh, longtime employee of Roanoke Cooperative, uh, we have uh, Judith um, Burnett, uh, she just came on with us just uh, a few months ago now, is it? I suppose time moves so fast. And we have one other outreach specialist, Ricky Freeman, uh, who's out of Bertie County, who's been with us since 22, I believe it is. Yeah, about 22. So we've grown a little bit, and uh, we've also grown uh, in our era of um, service. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, what I want to do, just give you a little history. Oh, I okay. Uh, a little history about the uh, the project itself. So these uh, four uh, organizations that you saw, uh, the project came about in 2013 uh, through a partnership with the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, which is a conservation organization out of South Carolina, uh, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, and the USDA Forest Service, which is one, is another one of the many agencies in USDA. Um, they came together and wanted to address the issue of uh, land loss in the African American community. When you look at the uh, numbers around 1910, there was about 15 million acres uh, African Americans owned. Uh, you look at those numbers today, they're ranging anywhere from two, two million. I've seen as many as maybe five. So, but any way you cut it, uh, any way you cut it or slice it, uh, about 90, 95% land loss. And that was due to many reasons, uh, um, discrimination, not having access to resources, access to financial uh, resources as well. Um, so those uh, led to a lot of land loss. And so they said, well, what would happen if an organization that was in the community, that was trusted in the community, to be the catalyst uh, or the one to bring all of these natural resource agencies and, and uh, different organizations together, whether it's federal, state, uh, nonprofit, uh, local, uh, county, bring these resources to African American landowners. Would they want engage? Uh, two, would they begin to put conservation practices on the land? And also a part of this was addressing the issue of land loss, and, and a lot of that is because of not planning uh, or succession planning, that is not having uh, where that land is going to for the next generation, not having wills when you, when you pass away, not using other types of uh, legal strategies to manage the land. Uh, and so we had about 30 months, um, there were four sites chosen in the pilot, we had about 30 months to prove this theory of change that they call it. And long story short is that after that 30 months, uh, in all the sites, uh, they were able to see landowners coming into the program, specifically African-American landowners, and actually those landowners were moving. They were moving somewhere. They were moving to, one, maybe getting forest management plans. Uh, two, they were maybe signing up and getting farm and track numbers that they didn't have, and also beginning to engage with NRCS, uh, FSA, uh, to put conservation uh, practices on the ground. So, um, so, so that went on, and so now today, uh, I have a slide that we'll, we'll show you in a little bit here, that there are now eight sites within what we call our Sustainable Forestry and Land Retention Network. Uh, and I will also say, Roanoke's mission is about uh, enhancing the quality of life of, of all the uh, member owners uh, and the diverse communities that it serves. So with that said, while our project focus and we continue that main focus of engaging African American landowners, we are available to assist any landowner across the project area uh, regardless, of, regardless of any type of dem demographic category. Um, so uh, this is a good slide right there to start. Uh, yeah, yeah, go right there. Go, uh, and 
Is it ready? Or no, oh, you see the chart. This is okay. Uh, it may be hard to see, but when you talk about heirs' property, and I'll do the disclaimers that I'm not an attorney, so don't ask me legal questions. I'm just going to give you some general background. Um, so, if you look at heirs' property, basically, you die without a will. Uh, if you die without a will, then those who are in that bloodline have that interest, and that can multiply, of course, as it goes through generations. When you look at the map uh, of North Carolina, it is uh, uh, an issue across the entire state, uh, from the coast to the mountains. You get up into Appalachia, you have some of the same issues. You get around tribal lands, that uh, issue is there too. So it, it is an economic issue uh, throughout um, the state. Uh, probably more disproportionately to African Americans uh, for the many reasons that I just mentioned. So I just wanted, wanted to uh, mention that. Okay. So uh, these are the other sites across the South that are part of the Sustainable uh, uh, Forest and Land Retention Network. So if you have family members or no others that have land in these other states, uh, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, uh, and Texas. Uh, you can reach out to these sites and they do the same thing there uh, that we do here. So uh, a, a great network of, of great folks doing this type of work. So, okay. Okay, so as far as our project, these are the counties that we are in, we're in 13 counties here in North Carolina. Uh, we had started with uh, seven counties, which was Roanoke Cooperatives membership um, service territory, and we were able to add additional counties. We uh, added uh, Edgecombe and Granville and Martin Nash and Warren and Vance. So those are the 13 counties we currently work in now. So what do we do? Our, our project goals really is about getting access and providing access to resources. Uh, you know, education is, is so so key. That's what you hear today. It's about education. If you don't know what you don't know, you don't know it. So you got to go learn it somewhere or get that information somewhere and somehow. Uh, technical assistance. You know, that's what you're here today. You know, how do you get that technical assistance? So what that technical assistance really is. And of course, financial assistance. What financial assistance is out there to assist you to implement those good conservation practices on the ground? And also providing us, we provide a way to uh, uh, access resources for estate planning, succession planning, uh, to ensure that that property or that land or that legacy goes to the next generation uh, in a strategy in a legal way. So education, again, many topics we talk about from carbon to um, uh, wildlife management, forest certification, uh, many forestry topics, any forestry topics, we try to bring that to, to you so you'll know about it, be more informed, uh, because forestry is a very broad economical uh, and environmental uh, topic, and it touches us uh, in many ways, just like agriculture. It is a form of ag agriculture. People oftentimes, when you think of agriculture, you, you think of row crops, but we do grow trees and rows, so uh, that's uh, it's the same, but... Our forest land are so important to us, and I'll talk to you in a minute about why that is. Uh, we have uh, trainings and educational sessions, sessions on estate planning. If anyone's here who, and I know several of you are, attended our annual conference last October, we, have, we typically have a session on uh, estate planning or succession planning. Uh, we, we've got a... a a webinar coming up, I believe in April, April 24th and 25th, I believe, that is being uh, hosted by uh, Extension, and they're going to go through some steps on some templates that they have on the information and documentation you need to gather as you're putting together your succession plan. So uh, we'll make sure through our connections here with everyone that uh, you are uh, made aware of that, and it's online, no cost, anything like that. So, uh, how do you participate in our project specifically? Uh, you have to have at least eight acres of contiguous forest land on 
an area of your property, one, a one area that's eight acres in size, uh, being one of those 13 counties, and those are really the only two criteria that you uh, have to meet. Um, what we'll do then is we'll enroll you, we'll meet with you, uh, along with our partners like uh, Terry uh, and his other NRCS uh, folks across our project area. The Forest Service is a big partner. Pretty much that first meeting is going to be with our staff, NRCS staff, and Forest Service. Those are the three initial partners you're going to, going to meet with. Then from that meeting, we'll provide you resources to connect with other partners that you may need um, services from. So, you know, why are our forests important? Oftentimes, um, we don't realize just what our forests really do for us across the country, across the world. Um, you know, how many of you knew there were over 4,000 products that come from forests? I, when I was at, I used to work with the North Carolina Forest Service, and I was always asking students, you know, Give me some names or give me some ideas of what paper products are out there, or what products come from trees. And they would say, and I say, what? Well, well, you can't say pencil, you can't say toilet paper, you can't say tissue. And then they go, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so there are 4,000 different products that have some derivative of a tree in it from your eyeshadow that you ladies wear, uh, from the shampoo that I don't use. Uh, <laughs> You know, from shaving cream that I do use, lotions, uh, chewing gum, uh, soft drinks, um, fingernail polish, you name it, glue, uh, and even in cameras, the film, since we've gone to digital now, but when the, the film that you had in cameras, that was made from some of the products of, of trees. So trees are very important in that respect. But also, of course, they provide us clean uh, water, uh, it's the biggest uh, brittle filter ever known to man. Uh, it filters everything as of today. It's taking all of the pollutants that may be coming out of our rainwater, going into our soil, the leaf structure there on the ground, that leaf duff actually uh, absorbs those chemicals and gets your water into your aquifers and your water is clean. Then it goes to your other process and uh, cleaner. But also, it provides shelter for wildlife, uh, reduces runoff. Uh, again, you may hear this big thing about carbon, carbon storage. Um, you know, trees take in carbon dioxide, provide oxygen. You know, forests are playing a major role in one of the buzzwords you'll hear is called uh, nature based nature based solutions. So uh, they're making a, or playing a big role in um, cleaning our air. Uh, when it comes to car uh, carbon. Uh, actually, recreation, you know, here's another one, you know, relaxation and spiritual connection. You know, in a lot of our cultures, we grew up, you know, on the farm or we had that spiritual connection to, to our forest, to our woodland, that type of thing. So just to be able to get away from the hustle and bustle of the day, to get out on your farm or take a walk in the forest, it's a, a great opportunity just to release those bad things, bad thoughts, and really connect back with nature and your spirit. And of course, last but not least, uh, it is a big economic um, impact across the state, uh, across the world, um, you know, internal government. I don't know if you realize this or not. So, but if you are a forest owner and you had uh, forest harvested, or even if you haven't had it for had it harvested, you are a part of a global economy. I don't know if you realize that or not. You are a part of a global economy. Whatever you're growing as far as your forest just doesn't stay right here. It goes everywhere. It's a part of everything. So you need to think that that when you are a, a farmer or you are a forest owner that you are not just helping what's right here in your own community, you're helping miles and miles away across this entire universe. Okay, technical assistance. So, you are a forest owner. Uh, what do you need to know? Um, you know, you want to keep your forest healthy, so you're looking at 
you know, making sure if you got forest uh, insect or disease or not, you may have had a damage, right, uh, damage from the storm. You may need to do some thinning or final harvest. Uh, you may be interested in wildlife management. So what's the first thing you need to do? What's the first item of business? What's the first thing you need to do? You guys know, what are Williams, you know, what's the first thing you need to get before you do anything else? Phone number, but what's that piece of paper, that thing that you got a little, somebody comes out and looks at it. A forest match, that again? A forest management plan. That is the first thing you got to get uh, if you are a forest landowner. You got to start right there. So, um, what does that plan do? So that plan is going to really tell you what your current conditions are. You know, what type of trees you have, how old are your trees, how are your trees growing, do you have uh, any insect or disease issues out there, uh, what type of soil you have out there. Um, you know, it, it's going to provide recommendations as well on what you need to do to maintain productivity and health of your farm. Uh, and also, any landowner, I'm sorry, any resource professional that is working with you, whether it's farming or whether it's forestry, and Terry talked about it today, the first thing they're going to ask you is what are your objectives and what are your goals? That's the first thing they're going to ask you. Because we're not writing this plan or doing this conservation in a sense we are for us, but it's your land. You have goals and objectives you want to meet. And they're all different. There are no cookie cutter goals and objectives. Everybody have different ones. And so that's going to be the first thing they're going to ask you about your forest land. Well, what is it that you want to do? Uh, you may say, uh, you know, I want to just keep it healthy. You may say, well, I want to manage for resource or multiple resource management. I'm interested in clean water, clean air. I'm interested in carbon. I'm interested in timber products. I'm interested in uh, wildlife. I'm interested in recreation. There are plans that can put all those things together addressing your objectives. But that's the first thing you've got to have is that plan. Now, how do you get that plan? Somebody's got to do that plan for you. So, uh, there are several ways. Uh, the North Carolina Forest Service, uh, which is in every county in North Carolina, has a county forest service office. You can uh, give them a call and say, I want a forest management plan. The forest ranger uh, and their forester will come out to your farm. Uh, you can go with them if you like, if your time permits. You can go out on the uh, assessment with them. They will walk over the entire property, looking at everything, and develop a forest management plan based on your uh, objectives. Also, you can get a conservation uh, activity plan. Terry, have you all changed the name of that? Is it still a cap or is it yeah, pretty much the same thing? Same thing, okay. So you can, through the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, you can apply to get funds uh, to get a forest management plan developed by what is called a technical service provider, a TSP, uh, that has gone through the training uh, through NRCS and can develop and write those plans. And then NRCS, if you're awarded, will pay for that TSP or technical service provider to develop that plan for you. Uh, also, uh, you can have a consulting private forester uh, who, who's out throughout uh, North Carolina. One of them can do a plan for you. Uh, they are private registered foresters who can develop those plans. Uh, some differences would be is that the North Carolina Forest Service cannot provide any market value or volumes, okay? They can only provide you the conditions and the recommendations for good uh, sustainable forest management. The TSP can, they can put a market value in the plan that they do, and of course the consulting forester uh, can do uh, markets uh, analysis as well. And we'll talk about the other thing that the consultants can do for you as well. Um, here, I, don't know, I don't know if you can see this or not, but there are some costs 
Uh, the Forest Service, uh, it's five dollars per wooded acre. Uh, if you're getting a present use taxation plan, the same thing. Uh, stewardship plan is the same thing. A tree farm plan, again, is all five dollars. A practice plan is no cost. A practice plan would be like you harvested your timber and you're ready to get it uh, reforested or reseeded. When they look at it at that time, it's called a practice plan. Or if they go out and you got standing timber and they recommend some type of what we call timber stand improvement, uh, that's a practice plan. Or if they may recommend a prescribed fire, a prescribed burn, that's a practice plan as well. Uh, the the full-blown forest management and stewardship plans, really looking at all the uh, components and coming up with a recommendation uh, for forest management. And again, these are just some of the things that plan will cover uh, from reforestation, site preparation, herbicide application, mechanical practices, timber stand improvement that I mentioned, and so forth and so on. And, uh, and now, possibly even civil pastures. So, I'm glad Terry's still here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about civil pasture, but what I'm talking about is going to be the very basics, very general. Um, if you got specific questions, Terry and Extension Forestry or uh, Corporate Extension may be the ones to go to, but we'll talk about it. Okay, so what is agroforestry? Okay, agroforestry is defined as delivering integration of trees and crops and or livestock on the same unit of land. Okay, now you've got, uh, you're putting something out there with your trees. Component of agroforestry is civil pasture. That is, this category of agroforestry, as you said, uh, in which trees are integrated and grazing animals create and manage woodland pasture. Two words going together woodland and pasture. We put them right there together woodland pasture. So I was looking at and doing a little bit of research last night, and I ran across something that said, Livestock running through your woods is not civil pasture. <laughs> so, so if you just turn your livestock out there and let them run and let them go, that is not technically civil pasture. But uh, there are all types of animals you can put out there, kind of goats, poultry, and swine, of course, and, and, and others. So what are some of the benefits um, of civil pasture? Protects the soil from water and wind erosion. Uh, adds organic matter uh, back to the soil, uh, provides cover for livestock to get them out of the elements. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, increases wildlife diversity. Uh, I even read something last night uh, about introducing bees into your civil pasture um, process and everything, so uh, that's possible. Improves water quality as well. Uh, there are economic uh, opportunities. So now you go from just looking at wood economics to um, livestock economics. There could be also carbon, because those trees are still taking in carbon as well. And also, uh, I threw this in, this market acceptance. The market in agriculture and in forestry has really changed the landscape. You know, when we were coming up, you know, we went to our local grocery store and just purchased our food. You know, or we killed our food on the farm, you know, and raised our food. Nowadays, people want to know where their food is coming from and how their food was, uh, was raised and where their tree products are coming from and is it coming off of a sustainable type of farm that's been, um, uh, been managed. It's not timber that has been stolen from uh, one country, brought over to another country, and that happens. Yeah, that happens. Uh, so folks, the marketplace has really driven this on wanting to know, I want to know where my stuff comes from. You know, uh, is, it, uh, is it pasture raised? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, how was it grown? How was it processed? You know, those types of things. So, because many of you have known and seen that you used to go to the grocery store, you, and you turn the back of that label over and leave the, leave the ingredients, it was that long. Most of them you couldn't even pronounce. You look at those ingredients now, they're, they're something like this, two, three, four, or five ingredients. So the marketplace has really changed that. 
So, before you do anything, whether it's forestry or agriculture, why do you want to do it? Just don't jump off the wagon today and say, I'm going to go do this. You know, it is a, uh, you know, an opportunity to fail. You want to know why you're doing it. You have to sit down and give this some thought what you're doing. You know, if you're looking at civil passion, so, you know, what are your objectives? You know, why do you want to do it? Do I have enough acres to do it? Is my forest already established? Do I need to plant trees? Uh, I'm getting ample sunlight to the forest floor. Mm. Have I researched it? You really got to sit down and give it some thought. Regardless of civil pasture, or you want to put a high tunnel up, or you want to grow vegetables, or any market you want to get into. You really got to sit down and think about it. Why do I want to do this? And once you think about why do I want to do this, or who do I go to and connect to that can help me put what I'm thinking uh, into action? And that may be some of your local agencies like the Forest Service, or NRCS. It could be mentors, it could be other landowners. Networking is one of the best ways uh, to see how a process happens. Somebody kind of has, I think I heard this before, the old rat cuts the hole and the little baby rat go through it. But somebody's got to do it first. And so, and most of these folks, or all of these folks I will say in here, have gone through the pains of understanding what it takes and I'm more than glad to share their experience with someone who's wanting to do something. Uh, so that's what's great about you know Whitaker's is that you guys come together and share and bounce ideas off of each other. And that's one of the things that I'm, I do like to do at our annual conference is give you that time to converse with each other. Because you can stand here all day and listen to talking heads. That's, that's not bad. But it's really about getting together and sharing ideas and uh, experience on this This worked for me. No, that didn't work for me. Why didn't it work? Well, let me show you. Yeah. So that is about all I have on civil tasks. But Terry, if you got more, you can gladly... Um, I'm glad you brought up ag forest, agro forest. Learn that word, what it is. Um, Google it. There's lots of information out there. Get good information. Um, Lincoln, Nebraska, typically has very good um, information. NRCS has some. Um, Agroforest, I think, is learn to grow food in the forest. How about that? Mm-hmm. Learn to grow foods in the forest. It's just that simple. Okay? That's yep. it. Yep. I think, <clears throat> I think we all are learning more and more about agroforestry. Uh, but civil pasture really is a uh, is an ancient practice. It's been here for ever, basically, uh, and we're now coming back to it. Um, uh, I know the U.S. Forest Service has a lot of information about agroforestry as well, uh, where you may be growing um, nut trees uh, in your in your pasture with your animals, or you're growing um, timber trees with other types of grasses. Uh, that could be used for some biofuel, possibly, or something like that, or some other research. So, again, um, that forest management, so kind of getting back to the forest management plan. If you go into Terry's office and you want to sign up for something, it might be a program, two things he's going to probably ask you. Do you have a plan? He probably asked you, do you have a farm number first? Do you have a farm number? And if you don't have a farm number, it's going to stop right there. Okay? Most forest landowners do not have farm and track numbers because you weren't doing any agricultural production on it. So it's just standing timber. So you're now going to need to go into FSA and, and get that farm and, farm and track number. Some farmers probably, and Terry, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, you know, if you've got a, a turnip farm, you may have a farm number, but you may have another wooded farm that may have a track number on it. But you've got to get that farm and track number to get into their systems to be able to 
um, uh, look at accessing those funds. But once you get past all of that, whether it's um, NRCS, whether it's the North Carolina Forest Service Forest Development Program, whether it's us, if you're in our program, you've got to have a forest management plan that addresses the resource concern or addresses what you want to do. So if you want to reforest or reseed, uh, that plan has got to have the information about when it was harvested and the forest is saying when it, what needs to be done, like site preparation, you may need a herbicide application, what type of trees to plant, that's what's going to be in that plan that you can use to apply to get resources or funding to implement those practices. So you've got to have those. Um, with us, just to throw it out, if you need a forest management plan and you're in one of those 13 counties, you don't. If you become a um, participant uh, of our project, there's funding there that we can assist with getting that plan developed for you. And I won't go into all these different plans. We can talk sidebar what they are, uh, but uh, even those are covered as well. Uh, and this is what we do. You know, there's been many times when USDA um, and agencies have brought information to landowners and it's kind of like UPS and FedEx. They bring it to your door and drop it and they leave. So what organizations like ours do is stand in the gap. So Terry just stood up here and told you he's got, what, 25 counties he's working, sounds like. <laughs> And so you can imagine his time is limited. So what we do is stand in the gap. So we not only deliver the package, we go inside and unpack it with you. So you can move through the process. Um, so that's why it's so important uh, that you have your, your connectivity with our, with our outreach specialists. Uh, Sheila and Judith and Ricky, they're going to call you and ask why haven't you, or what have you done, where are you at, what questions you got, um, and so they can help nudge you along a little bit. <clears throat> we want to stay connected with you. Even when you get a contract, uh, specifically around forestry, when you get a contract, uh, we want to make sure you stay within that deadline. Uh, <laughs> she was laughing. We do that. That's what they do. They call. Oh, I wouldn't know. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Yeah, you, you got to do that. So, so we try to do our best to stay connected with you. But if we call, so you learn what Sheila's number is, what Ricky's number is, what Judy's number is. If they call you, call them back, please. Just call them back. That's all you got to do. Just call, just call them back. You know. Then you go three weeks. Don't call them back. You call them back then. Saying, I got an issue. Well, call them back, you know. <laughs> Just call them back so they can help you avoid those issues. Uh, you know, again, stand there to make sure you get all your questions answered. Uh, there are other opportunities for monies out there in, uh, um, in forestry. Many of you have heard about carbon markets. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, for small landowners, we haven't cracked that nut yet to be able to really say that it'll be beneficial for you. We're working on it. SFLR is working with other organizations. But in the meantime, you do have incentives through NRCS on climate smart practices that you can look to get those incentives, uh, conservation uh, stewardship program, those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, hunting leases, uh, recreational leases, PUV. How many landowners here? Uh, First, know about present use taxation. Okay, a few. Okay, present use taxation in the state of North Carolina. If you have a, if you have ten acres of, of farmland and you're producing three thousand dollars or more over a three-year period, if you have twenty acres of woodland and have a forest management plan, you can get reduced property taxes. Those reduced property taxes that we've seen over our project can range anywhere from as little as 40 to as much as 70 percent with property taxes being reduced. But you got to have a forest management plan to do that. 
Uh, you have to have at least 20 acres of agriculture, I'm sorry, of forestry, not, not open land. Open land is only 10. Uh, Agritourism is something that we are, are getting into now and working with our landowners through a partnership with uh, 40 acres and the small business um, center there at Halifax Community College. You know, people will pay to come sit around a burning barrel. Now, my dad used to make me go out and put stuff in that burning barrel, and I didn't get paid nothing. But now, people will come out and, and use your farm and see your farm, and you can make money off it. Yes, there are some, some things you got to get in place first, of course, but there are opportunities there. And so one of the things that I, I continue to talk with landowners about, specifically small landowners, and when I say small, I'll say maybe 100 acres or less. Um, and, and even even above it, but really, I think the the average is with us is about 62 acres. You have to look at stacking economic um, streams on top of each other, whether it's food, forest, livestock, you know, agrotourism. The more income streams you have, the more profitable overall you can be, because the trees, in in most terms, are going to be there. Once you plant them, it'll be about 15 to 18 years before you get your first thinning off of those. So you need something in between. So you just have to stay connected and see what's out there and how you can uh, make funding or get funding to implement practices. NRCS right now is paying you to do good practices on the land. So that's an income stream. Uh, I think that is going to be about all i got. Again, partnerships is so powerful. Uh, if it hadn't been or uh, has not been for our partnership with many of you in the room, our agency folks, uh, forest industry, uh, you know, SFL law wouldn't be where it's at. We haven't been, would not have been able to provide funding um, to landowners to implement these practices on the ground. Uh, you can save the date now. Our, our landowner conference is coming up in October uh, 23rd and 24th. It'll be at the Rocky Mount Event Center if you all came last year at the same place. Uh, hopefully, uh, through our connections and connectivity, we'll be sending information out and make sure that we're going to know about it so you can get it out to all of your networks and, and, and folks. So, uh, also, we have a youth component of our program. Uh, and it is so important that our next generation understand the importance of what you're doing, but also uh, participate as employees, as resource professionals in these resource uh, career pathways. So on July the 25th, at the same location, at the Rocky Mountain Event Center, we're going to have our youth summit. gives the opportunity for our students uh, around the region to come and meet other professionals like Terry, uh, and, and Jamie and uh, other USDA Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service. Uh, we also have some of our local universities there that are doing things like robotics and, and soil health, soil testing and things. Just to really give them a, a big and broad view of, of opportunities in the career, uh, career field. Uh, because uh, forestry and agriculture, the perception of a lot of folks young and old, is that I'm on a tractor or I'm in the woods. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's much broader than that. Um, and so we really wanted those students to come out somewhere between that. Uh, we usually focus on ninth to 12th graders. Uh, so we really uh, be on the lookout for that as well. And I think I'll uh, set up after this. I'm done. Good job. Good job. I just wanted to remind everyone in your packets is a photo release form. Um, if you haven't signed it yet, you can please sign it, leave it on the table, we'll pick it up. Uh, we're taking pictures and we would love to use you on our Facebook and future work. <laughs> 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 
Thirty-five-ish, eight-ish. When I start yelling, we'll get going. <laughs> <laughs> 